In today's talk, we will be covering introduction to gas chromatography detectors. We also cover versus different type of detector and how their functions. Also, we will try to give some guidance in choosing the right detector for your analysis. We have a two ages learning webinar on mass spectrometry in our fall semester. We feel MS deserve a lot of discussion by itself. The vacuum ultraviolet detector learning course also will be held on the June 4th, 2020 at Perkin Elmer University. So in the first step of detector selection, there are the items which we need to consider to choosing the correct detector, such as sample type, matrix of sample, known or unknown targets, detection limits, dynamic range, essay of use, selective versus the universal, and the cost. So these are the some important factor which we should know about that before pick any detector. So in this talk, we will discuss about the sum of these items. I will mention one example here. Perhaps you don't have many components of interest in your sample, but your sample matrix is interfering with them. You should consider using the mass spectrometer. Even tau, we will be covering the mass spectrometer in fall semester. I would like to discuss a couple of the advantage here. And a mass detector has a better sensitivity, so even if you have only known compounds, you may need the mass for sensitivity. Let's discuss about the three important characteristics of GC detector. The first one is the difference between the distractive detector versus non-distractive detector. A distractive detector destroys the components or decompose your target after detecting, but a non-distractive detector keeps the components intact. The advantage of the non-distractive detector is that it allows the effluent to flow into another detector, which providing the additional information about your components if required. The second one is the difference between concentration-based detector versus mass flow-based detector. So, a detector can respond to either change in the concentration of component of interest or to the rate of the mass transfer of components in the carrier gas. Some detectors, like a TCD or ECD, are generally sensitive to concentration change, and any flow rate change or dilution of the stream with the makeup gas has effect on detector response. That's one reason why it is not recommended to use the constant pressure modes in the GC. When using this type of detector, because of the flow rate will be changed during the analysis and discrimination may occur. Some other detectors like FID or NPD are sensitive to mass flow change of the elements in the carrier gas stream, and the response of such a detector also remain unaffected by dilution with the makeup gas or flow rate change. And finally, a selective detector responds to a specific component or class of components, which we call the selective detector. For example, TCD or thermal conductive detector is a universal detector, which means that the, um, this detector responds to almost any elements except the carrier gas itself. We will show you the example of the both selective and universal detector in the next slides. In this table, we are listing some of the more popular selective and universal detector. A selective detector is a selective for a specific species. The selectivity for that particular species may be obtained from the literature. For example, a flame photometric detector is selective for sulfur and phosphor. However, if other species are present at the high enough concentration, they will be detected as well. The ECD has a good selectivity for electrophilic components, uh, such as oxygen and halogen contained components. And it is used in the several environmental applications, for example, pesticide, and also in the food industry for diacetyl in beer. Diacetyl is a component that tastes like butter, and folks would not like their beer to taste like butter. A FPD is selective for sulfur and phosphor and has many applications in the petroleum and chemical industry. The other detector is ELCD, which, uh, which is an extremely selective detector. However, 
because it required a lot of maintenance, applications using this detector have moved to the MS. The SCD is a nice detector as well. It is uni unimolar, which means you can calibrate with any standard components, unfortunately, and SCD requires a lot of maintenance. It is selected for sulfur-containing components, and it is widely used in the petroleum industry for determining of the sulfur. The other powerful detector is NPD, which is a very selective detector for nitrogen and phosphor. However, most people have moved onto their MS or VUV because the detection limits are lower and there are more components that can be investigated. And in most cases, you will know with the component is form the spectrum, which is a selectivity. PID is another powerful detector, especially for BTEX or aromatic components. Many people use this configuration in tandem with the FID. Even thought, putting the PFPD in the selective category, some folks consider it to be a semi-selective detector. The SCD is another detector which is a very selective for halogen components. We have a talk on this de dedicated to the disk detector on June 16 in our petroleum industry. A universal detector will detect just about the components passing through it, even though a flame ionization detector is classified as a universal detector, but it will not detect the components without hydro hydro hydrogen carbon bonds or will have not an efficient response to them. Since most components have a CH bonds, it is classified as a universal detector. So this means the TCD, VUV, and MS are true universal detector. In addition to being the universal detectors, MS and VUV are excellent selective detector because of the their fragmentation pattern and a spectral information. This third dimension provides extremely valuable information. In addition, in the majority of the case, component separation is not required as long as there is a uniqueness in the co looting components. Before we start to discuss some common GC detector, I would like to discuss some detector specification which they are particularly important because the detector performance can determine whether an analysis can be performed successfully or not for your requirements. So in the first one is the minimum detectability. So people refer to this as the minimum detection limit, which is defined as a minimum concentration of analyte that can be discriminate from the noise, which is determined by the single to noise ratio. The next item is the sensitivity, and finally the last one is the linearity. We will be discussing these in details in coming slides. Actually, signal-to-noise is used to determine if there is a peak or if the component is not detected. As you can see in this example GC peak, noise is a background signal produced by the detector in the absence of the analyte. The background comes from the electronics temperature fluctuation, column bleed, gas, etc. Some regulatory agency and a standard method have defined aloneness for the signal to noise. I typically will not accept anything under the 10 to 1. The EPA is some of their methods except 3 to 1. This value is used to set an MDL or method detection limit. The method detection limit does, does not have to be linear but has has to have an acceptance signal to noise. Some regulation require a certain precision at the MDL like APA methods. As you can see in this example, analytical definition of the sensitivity is a slope of the plot amount of analyte x-axis versus the signal response, which is a y-axis, or amount of analytes that gives an acceptance response. It is advantage to have a slope of one. This will provide a greatest deviation between response and concentration. In this example, the internal standard calibration was performed on the component of the cocaine. If a sample's results is outside of the this limits, linearity need to be confirmed prior to the resulting being reported. The quantitative results can only be reported in the calibration range. 
And finally, the linear dynamic range is a concentration range over when the detector response is in a linear relation with, with the change in concentration of analytes. As you can see in this graph, in this part showing the deviation from linearity at high analyte. Because the detector is saturated and there is no difference in response for increasing in concentration. In the lower part, we can still detect the component at those concentrations, but we are not linear. Quantitative results can only be reported with their calibration range, the upper and lower concentration on the standard calibration. The lower concentration is called the reporting limit. If result is below the reporting limit, one can say the component was detected above the MDL or method detection limit, but not in the linear range. So the exact number cannot be provided. If, you, if your sample was in the quench concentration of detector, there is a solution. You can dilute your samples and re-inject. So it is in the calibration or dynamic range. This slide has a very useful information when you decide to select a non-mass detector for your analysis. If you require better select sensitivity or if you have a hydrocarbon co-looting that you don't want a result for, having the selective detector will do the trick. If the selective detector will not respond to the hydrocarbon in your concentration, you will have a response for only the component of interest. Dynamic range is an important decision, especially if your sample are going to have extended varying concentrations. For instance, an FPD detector in sulfur moods only has a dynamic range of two order of magnitude. If your sample's concentration vary more than that, for using this detector, you will need to dilute to not saturating the detector. FID detector, which is one of the universal detector, has an extensive dynamic range. If universality is what you need, because you need to detect component that the selective detector cannot, and if you don't have all well-resolved component, and they are all known components, if ID is a perfect choice for you. However, going with the MS is an advantage because you can most likely speed up your analysis. Because the separation is not a critical as long as there is a unique ion to use, which in the most of the case they exist. If you have unknowns and you need to identify, MS and VUV is required. Even when the, with a non-mass or non-VUV selective detector, there is always chance of the contaminant colluding with, with your target that has a response in the detector. This will result in reporting the false positive or an incorrect results. Batch of product have been thrown away because of the false positive costing the industry more money than what the confirmatory detector costs. The selectivity columns let us know how the selective detector is most of the case with the respect to the carbon. Let's use the ECD as an example. The hydrocarbon would need to be at least in the high percentage level to be detected. This is typically the sol solvent as is the case in pesticide analysis, where there is a response to hexane or isobutane. If you see these columns, in the last columns, um, display the detector that are non-destructive in case you would like two detector in series, especially two selective detector, if your analysis require this. An MS detector is a destructive while the VUV isn't. However, an MS is more sensitive to it depend upon the needs. This will be discussed in the later courses. So in this session, I'm going to focus on these four common GC detector. Flame ionization detector, electron capture detector, thermal conductivity detector, and nitrogen phosphor detector. And we will have a separate talk about the VUV detector at Perkin Alma University on June 4th. And also I'm going to invite you to attend to mass spectrometry course in the fall semester. Flame ionization detector or FID is one of the most popular 
detectors. It shows high sensitive to most organic components. So this means when the heteroatoms are present with the analyte molecules, the sensitivity of the detector is much reduced. And if I use very stable detector, in this slide, you can just see some of the specification of the detector, like high sensitivity, large dynamic range, low noise, and the max temperature of this detector is 450 degrees. But going to this temperature, we need to ensure our analytical column stationary phase is capable of functioning in that temperature and will not degrade. This detector requires two fuel gases. Hydrogen and air. The Perkinol Marified Detector design does not require a makeup gas to get the components out of the flame without the dead volume. Because of the placement of the hydrogen inputs, it served as a combustion fuel and the makeup gas at the same time. The stoichiometric ratio of the air hydrogen are important to get the proper response. If using the hydrogen as a carrier gas, please remember to reduce the amount of hydrogen in the detector by the amounts because the carrier will add the flow rate and then the ratio will not be proper. In this slide, you can see the picture of the FID detector, which has a different part, like a collector, flame jet, hydrogen and air in, and column connections, as you can see in this picture. But how this detector works? So the column effluent is mixed with the hydrogen and air and the makeup gas if it's required, and ions are formed by the combustion of the organic molecule in the flame, and they became ionized. And their energy is a proportional to the energy in the hydrogen carbon bonds. As a column effluent is burned in the flame, ions are created which form a small current when the potential difference is applied. When the new analyte is being burned, a small background current 10 to 20 picoamperes arises from impurity in the carrier and detector gases. Therefore, the response is the ionization potential in the carbon hydrogen bands. Also, it is recommended, if possible, to use the detector temperature 20 to 30 degrees hotter than the final oven temperature. This will keep the detector cleaner longer and prevent any condens condensation in the detector. In this slide, I want to give you an example of the molecules that do not respond in FID. But before that, I would like to mention Paraffins or normal hydrocarbons and aromatics provide the most intense signal in FID. Here is a list of some common GC elements and components that are routinely investigated by gas chromatography, but not by FID. The majority of these will not respond in FID. Formaldehyde, carbon disulfide, and H2S will have a very small response. Moisture will not give the response as well. However, because of the, its cooling effect on the detector, you may see a change in the baseline while the water is eluting. Because of this, it may quench the signal of the target components eluting at the same time. In some petroleum applications, this quenching effect is since when the CS2 is used as a solvent. Before leaving the FID, I would like to point out the effect of functional groups and other elements on the response. Since the response in FID is due to ionization potential in the hydrocarbon bond and electronegative elements in the molecular will reduce this energy. Decreasing the energy is in the bond there before the decreasing the response of the detector. For example, the oxygen on the molecule can reduce the response by 40%. Chlorine can reduce this response by 20%. Of course, depend on the components. The next detector which I would like to discuss is electron capture detector. This detector measures the electrical conductivity of the effluent gas stream, resulting from exposure to ionizing radiation from radioactive elements. 
It is a selective detector that responds to component capable of the capturing electron, in particular halogenated and oxygenated components. Like FID, the ECD response is component specific. The specification provided of 20 femtogram is, a, is for the pesticide. This is an incredible sensitivity. A mass spectrometer in negative CI modes provide the best sensitivity for the most halogens. The dynamic range is also good, or however, not as good as the FID, but an FID couldn't attain the detection limit of the 20 femtogram of the pesticide, which is a required by drinking water methods. Again, a trade-off of requirements. Historically, we use the 5% methane argon mix as a makeup gas, but now the popular makeup gas is nitrogen. It is cleaner and provides a bit more sensitivity. There is a balance between the keeping the detector cleaner and response. We have found that 30 ml per minute flow is the sweet point for this detector. In this slide, we will discuss about the how the electron capture detector works. You can see the picture of the ECD over here. As you can see here, the radioactive nickel-63 sealed inside the ECD detector. These radioactive elements emit the electron or beta particle, which this reactions formed a stable cloud of free electron in ECD detector cell and ionize the makeup gas molecule which located into the detector. Now, if any electronegative component present in the carrier gas, the background current is reduced because these components capture the electron. And these current reductions makes the detector signal. One of the factors which affect in the ECD detector is a carrier gas. Detector gas should ultra clean and dry because the oxygen and water are electronegative and contribute to noisy baseline and reduction of the sensitivity. To reducing the oxygen contamination, there are some solutions like changing the filter, changing the leak check fitting, and also injector maintenance. And also fluctuation in the carrier gas flow will cause the interruptions in response and the baseline stability. Again, we recommend it to make up gas flow up to 30 ml per minute for operation and 100 ml per minute for a baking. The next detector that I would like to talk about that is a thermal conductivity detector or TCD. TCD detector is a universal detector which is capable of detecting almost any species as long as their thermal conductivity is differentiated from that of the carrier gas used. And sensitivity of the detector depends upon the equipment setup and the differential in thermal conductivity between the analyte and the carrier gas. LOD of the detector is around 10 ppm and detector stability is reasonable. Dynamic range is greater than 10 to the 5, and uh, the makeup gas and reference gas is the same as the carrier gas in this detector. This detector is one of the few detectors that can measure the permanent gas in the industry. How the thermal conductivity detector or TC detector works? As we mentioned in the last slide, this detector works based on the thermal conductivity between the carrier gas and carrier gas plus components. While the carrier gas flowing, the flow amount is equal. The thermal conductivity will be equal and the flow amount will have the same rate of the heat loss and their signal will be zero. If the analytes loot with the carrier, the thermal conductivity of the gas in the analysis cell change. The rate of the heat loss of the two filaments will not be balanced and the current will have to be applied, which is recorded as a detector signal. This means the greater temperature differentiated in the greater detector sensitivity for this detector. 
The other detector which I would like to discuss about that in this talk is the nitrogen phosphor detector or NPD. The design of this detector is very similar to FID detector and belongs to the family of the ionizing detector, but it works under different principles. The NPD is approximately 50,000 times more sensitive to nitrogen and phosphor contained components than to the carbon contained components, which making this detector is very selective toward the nitrogenated and phosphorated components. The detection limit of the 10 picogram and selectivity to the nitrogen phosphor makes it especially useful for the analysis of the mainly pharmaceutical and for environmental sample contain herbicides. So how this detector works? As I mentioned in the last slide, main structure of the detector looks similar to the FID. As you can see in this picture, the main difference is the addition of the heated bit just above the jets. So the bit is coated with the cesium or rubidium silicate. When they heat it, these bits emit the electron which migrate to the collector electrode and form the background current. So the other thing is difference here is that instead of the flame, we have a plasma here, which fuel is hydrogen and oxidizer is air. So when the carrier gas effluent and makeup pass over the bits at the which point, Partial combustion occur due to the heating filament, and when the suitable analyte is eluded into the plasma, the partial combustion nitrogen or phosphor material are absorbed onto the surface of the bead. Then the emitted electron density increase, which cause the increase the current in the detector, and which which is amplified and became the chromatography peaks. Typically, NPD detectors are run at a slightly higher temperature than FID detector. 260 to 350 is a typical temperature for NPD detector, which helps to extend the bit lifetime as well. Also, this detector is sensitive to variation in the hydrogen flow rate, and the constant flow of the hydrogen is recommended to ensure steady baselines. In the other solution can be good for extend the life of the bits is here. Like using the lowest practical bit voltage, turn the bit off when they're not in use or use the high detector temperature when possible. But if the detector is off for a long period of time, moisture may be accumulate in the detector. To evaporate the moisture, set the detector temperature at 100 degree and maintain it for 30 minutes and then set the detector temperature to 150 and maintain Maintain, maintain it for another 30 minutes. Also, clean sample aid in the extending the bit life as well. So if it's possible to clean up your sample, this will be helped. So in conclusion, I have to say it is critical to attain the correct detector for your sample and requirement for the best results. Our Perkin Elmer team also can help you to ensure this happens.